that. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say about, uh, about Jason Smith's book. It's incredible. Yes, um, I'm looking forward to that myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I found the book to be quite wonderful and putting what it is that we're doing into a context that I think is very important. Right. Very important. Really true. Uh, okay, so good good evening, everyone. Um, we are launched on <laughs> the June series of Colleen Kubert's um, Open Studios, and uh, today we're going to start with the spiritual card uh, that Colleen has in mind, and uh, it will be a terrific teaching. So please. Fasten your seatbelts and stay with us because it's going to be an interesting one today. So, uh, Colleen, uh, you're you're in charge. Thank you, uh, thank you, Skip, and thank you for providing this format for us. Um, certainly, after having J Jason Smith last Saturday, the synchronicity of the timing couldn't be any better. Right. It's uh, it's an indication that this is going on in the collective unconscious and time for us to start to take a look at it. I think that the um, the whole human potential movement came along to take the place of one's spiritual life for many of us. Mm -hmm. I would include myself in that, mm -hmm. um, but not realizing it, it was simply, it was taking the place of what the church was unable to do. But there are a couple of things that my Jungian teachers, uh, Elizabeth Howes, Sheila Moon, and Luella Sibold, uh, told me that Jung said that I'm not finding in his writings. Uh -huh. So I can say this is from the master's mouth almost, once, <laughs> once removed. Okay. Um, but that Jung said that we are all born born with a religious card and we know what it is down deep um, and we know whether we're Christian we know whether we're Protestant or Catholic uh, we know whether we're Jewish Muslim it doesn't matter Buddhist it doesn't matter you know and the images of this religion for you come up in your dreams. If, if, if you uh, went to uh, school, Sunday school, or, or um, what, do, what do Jewish people call it, uh, that they go temple. to? Temple for yeah. classes. Um, whether you were educated, let's say that, mm -hmm. uh, or not. I was in the Episcopal Church and considered myself an Episcopalian through my marriage, through my wedding, and, and through the baptism of my children. Um, so the, the church played a role in my life, but I slowly began to drift away from the meaning of the teachings. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, uh, I think that was an important uh, message from Jung. Um, just like he says, we have a, um, a creative drive that is separate from the libido. Um, it's so important for us to know that. Well, it's important for us to know the uh, spiritual card that we were born with. So we start with that. The other thing that I learned from that they, they quoted Jung as saying is that um, you need both your psychological learnings as well as your religious learnings. When times are hard, something really hits you hard. Mm. Um, if you go to the church, it's not going to be enough anymore. Um, and you'll, you'll tumble into a darkness from which there is no bottom. That's when you need your psychological learning as well. Mm -hmm. But if you only rely on your psychological learning and you don't keep your spiritual learning up, you'll go mad, that the questions are endless, uh, and that at some point you have to accept 
what it is that the spiritual teachings are about. So I, I learned that from those women um, in the 1960s. And I remember it like yesterday. And it's colored everything that I've learned about Jung since. Uh, so that moved me to um, ask you all last time to do a collage about your spiritual life. That was before I had gotten into Jason Smith and heard him last Saturday. But those of you who attended that or have watched it since, uh, hear what he is saying about the importance of our not tossing the baby out with the bathwater, but realizing that our spiritual path needs to be taken a look at. Uh, and I certainly, uh, I like very much the way he puts puts it. The um, For those of you that aren't familiar with his book. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful book, and I, I will put a link to our conversation with Jason uh, in the description for this uh, video as well, so people can find his talk because he he talked to us for two hours graciously and um, you know, it was very powerful. Yes. Well, I, I will refer to um, him uh, once or twice while we're uh, together today. Um, but I, I love the way he talks about suffering the experience, and I asked him a question about that. He says, thus are coming to terms with the unconscious, as it was described in relation to the practice of active imagination. Uh, he's talking about active imagination and our religious life, and taking what we know about active imagination to our religious life. Um, it is not so much a process, a process of categorizing and conceptualizing as it is a suffering of the experience. And that was what Jung has written about, uh, is that it is the experience that we have that is spiritual to us, the numinous experiences that we have that count, that are so important. And I, I think in my own opinion, it's where the church did not know what to do with that. Right. Uh, was unwilling to go to that place to help us to deal with what is experience. How do you put experience into words? You can't. You, it takes symbols. Uh, the unconscious, the experience comes from the unconscious. It takes symbols to relate with the unconscious. And... Um, on the front of his book, he has this, this symbol. Um, and uh, he says, living the life, living the symbolic life, which is a quote from Jung. Uh, but this, this symbol is a very interesting one. Uh, the blue and the gold, and where blue and gold overlap and become green. Now, these right. colors in our ancestry in our DNA, maybe even in our collective unconscious have come to have the have meaning. Um, Kandinsky knew it, Offklant knew it. Um, let's see what there's an example of her. Moving the gold. She said gold stands for the masculine. And blue stands for the feminine. And when the masculine and the feminine meet, they become green, which is the color of harmony. So here are some examples of blue and green. I mean, blue and uh, yellow coming together. They're almost always spoken of in her paintings. Um, and um, she and Kandinsky, who they never met, but he did see her work um, and so admired it. And it's a little stunning to see his work after he saw her work, because that's when he started working in circles and triangles and moving them around to say what it is that he had to say <clears throat> and um, to bring us to the 
project today of this collage um, to say what it is that you had to say about your spiritual life. Mm -hmm. uh, off Clint took herself into her studio and said, I'm going to paint what it is that I know about my spiritual life. And mm -hmm. that was what she did. Kandinsky did the same thing. And my dear teacher, Mary Holmes, who, who some of you met Mary uh, while she was still alive, teaching at uh, Santa Cruz, built, she said we should all build a eight by 10 foot room and paint what we believe. It's quite a challenge, but she, yeah. she did it. Here's an aerial view of her chapel. Terrific. Her eight by 10 foot room is off to the side of the chapel. You can see her labyrinth, her Celtic labyrinth. And Mary started all of this at the age of 70. So um, she lived to be 93 years old and she was so, building up to the- up So there's still hope for some of us. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> if yes. we get serious. <laughs> yeah. So um, you remember the the uh, collage that I've been working on since we first started to meet. I'm going to switch my camera here. And um, this was, I think it's familiar to some of you. Right. Uh, and I had suggested that you take a part of your collage and progress it. Um, make it larger. And you might remember, um, I decided to take that corset that's down in the bottom left hand corner. And um, so that you can see it. And I took a photograph of it and blew it up. Where is my, my, here it is, thank you. And blew it up and um, and took a magnifying glass, noticing the label on the corset, and discovered the Kalal sisters, who um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s were designers in Paris. This, is, this corset is absolutely beautiful, made of lace and ruffles and bones, no, no doubt whale bones. And uh, on the label, it says Kalal sisters Paris. So I looked them up and discovered that they uh, were designing prior to the First World War. But because of the First World War, they felt that women had gone through so much, they wanted to design beautiful clothes, beautiful lingerie, uh, something that would be more comfortable than the cinched in corsets that women had been wearing in the late 1800s. And um, so I, um, was inspired by them and their success because they uh, they did have a very important house uh, and uh, they they succeeded through that period of time between the first world war and second world war and after the second world war and after they died they uh, their young brother took over uh, the house and it continued on into the 40s and 50s um, so I looked them up, as you said, as I said, and uh, then I made them in uh, clay. Here's my first corset in mm -hmm. clay. Um, this is a, a direct takeoff of the one that's in the collage, uh, corset number one. <laughs> <laughs> this is corset number two. Wow. And um, I'm not You've sure where busy. the... <laughs> and I uh, got in touch with my mother's stitching and sewing and my daughter's stitching and sewing and my grandmother's uh, doing this. And while I'm doing this over my shoulder, my son is making some exquisite shirts that he's stitching and sewing. Mm. It runs deep in the family and um, got me in touch with those, um, those family roots that mean a lot to us and is definitely influenced my spiritual path. Um, so that's working its way into my uh, spiritual collage, which I'll share with you later. And now, now I'd like to see some of yours. You switch back to uh, my okay. camera. 
just a sec. Yeah, how would you like to begin now? Well, I, I have everybody that sent me one, I have them on a PowerPoint, so I'll share them. Okay. With you. Okay. Good. So this is sharing my screen. And uh, the first one is Nancy Pfaff. Nancy. All right. Oh, well, Nancy. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Thank you for your message, Nancy. <laughs> and, You're welcome. Uh, Tell us about your collage and your uh, what it tells us about your spiritual life. Well, uh, it, these are images I liked and cut out from the magazines as I held the intention about my spiritual life, the, the whole path from beginning till now. And so each little piece represents uh, an aspect of that. At the very bottom, you see black. And when I was about three years old, I woke up in a coma. And I could hear people, and I could think just fine, but I couldn't open my eyes or move my body. And oh. I think that experience really was an opening to the depths at that point. Mm. And uh, it, then we have light on water. So even I think at that very young age, uh, there was contact with the spiritual. Yeah, and, yes, uh, yes. Birth there. And then over time, you know, like various experiences. Uh, and then that uh, image at near the top, it's uh, golden on the bottom and red on the top is my current situation where I've just experienced a dramatic uh, opening, spiritual opening to the depths. The marriage of Mel, is it Mal Malka and Tifereth? I don't know, mm -hmm. some of you can Malkuth. say that better. Malkuth and Tifereth. Malkuth, yeah. yeah. And uh, the garden of pomegranates. So mm -hmm. um, the archway, signifies the uh, church. For me, I was very fortunate as a child to go to a liberal Methodist church and it was fun and the stories and the images were uh, wonderful and the fellowship and the love of one another in the church for each other was wonderful. So that uh, really started me down the Christian path which has shifted dramatically in 2019 to include uh, all the paths. Uh, I did teach religious studies at the university here in Reno for a period of time. So I was familiar with a variety of the religions, but it seems as if now uh, there's just this openness to the depths, to the center, to all that is so it's inclusive what uh, what has it been like for you to do this to do the what, collage to do the collage and put your experience together like this it was uh there was a sense of serenity to it ah a uh -huh. sense of rightness a sense of serenity to uh, to what to um, you said that I, it, it felt like I was, you know, going with the stream mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, without any obstacles. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Beautiful. I'm not familiar with the characters that you put in the collage, although some others, Skip, you seem to be, and Kathy and Jessica here are. What, who are the characters? Kabbalah. Oh, the Kabbalah. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Have you studied the Kabbalah at all? Very little, but I have great respect for it. It's, it's a little complicated for me, and mm -hmm. I, to really get it, I'd have to really study it. But oh. I've been, let's say I've been exposed to it. Uh -huh. But I had I had a dream in 2014 where I'm in this 
garden and it's like a public garden but very very beautiful and there's a bush of pomegranates mm. and one of the pomegranates flies up in the air and lands on the top of a white tower in a little cup and the gates open so I can go out Wow! and wow. that was seven years ago and and that has happened for me this year and is that is that expressed here in your collage? The well, gate? only only symbolically. Uh huh. Yeah. Not not intentionally. Uh huh. But that might be a place to take it further now. That's a good idea. Oh, it'd be wonderful. It'd be wonderful to see that um, symbolized. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Um. That. If I could say something, the the image oh, yes. of the half a moon with with the crown going up, you know, it, it's very Egyptian. Yeah, so yeah. Since she's mm -hmm. being connected oh, to Malkuth and Sir, um, you know, it goes back to it all the way to Egypt. Yeah. Very definitely. Thanks for the feedback, everybody. Yeah. Yes. Any other comments about Nancy's? Excuse me. I just had an allergy attack. <laughs> I would say I just put in the chat, but such a wonderfully clear removal of the veils. The, it's transcending the high priestess, where there's a clear view into the inner world, and instead of just the two pillars, even of the Kabbalah. Um, there literally is just the Janus to from portal that is from here to there, except instead of a mystery, there's just, it feels like this wonderful knowing of this visceral and I have to, the only word is verdant, fertile pomegranate experience. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think one of the nice things about it in relation to what Jason was talking about is that we need a grounding. Uh, we need some way mm -hmm. to ground our spiritual lives. And I think this frame does that, you know, that it makes it very clear, you know, here's where it's at, this is what's happening. And it's contained, it has a container. Well, it, I so resonate with that statement. I, I missed Jason's unfortunately thing in the middle of my move, but. But the fact that there's an architectural portal, yeah. there's here and there's there. And so instead of a nebulous everything or microscopic, there's very much a scale of passage, of experience, uh -huh. of, um, I think you said, um, you know, experience and passage and all these things are important to our spiritual life. But the fact yeah. that there's just a portal and that I can see the scene behind, around that leftover kind of Ozymandias before it was just two stumps of stone in the sand arch. And it's, except outside the arch, I see it clearly, but that feels like here, like a reflection. But I see the same thing inside and there's such a balance of the same oh. scene moving back and forth. Yes. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. I find very interesting that she brought the light to the bottom. So the reflective light is at the bottom, but it's lit up mm -hmm. with gold and sun and also at the top. So and, it's, and it's blue and gold. <laughs> so she seems to be, yes. yeah. uh, 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 she's balanced, uh, even though she uh, commented on the black at the bottom. She brought down the luminosity and as well shut it, shoot it, shut it up the shakti towards the, the top. So it's very huh? balanced in that way. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, N Nancy sent me this one and she was the first in and I go, wow, <laughs> goodness gracious, I'm gonna have to do something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yes, yes. Gilda, Gilda too, that I, it's very honestly, beautiful. I don't know how I missed it. That whole base, the dark base. There's almost like if I look in, is there this microscopic community of people on top of the earth? But if I don't, 
scroll in. It's just this uncertain footing, but it's so solid. Yeah. Like that comfortability with a not knowing that, well, you kind of cross that threshold, but there's just, it's almost like a biblical event allegory in that bottom <laughs> dark. Yeah. It's like, you know, and it may yeah. just be watercolor burn, which, which is even better. So. Well, from the unformed uh, ground, grounds of being in her picture, she formed the symbol up, upwards. So the symbol is clear. Uh, risen to the top so, mm. and then everything is framed in and uh, amidst the complication of the background of ma modernity which I it kind of has that sense so it's, it, it's very nicely accomplished yeah so let me just ask one question Jerome uh, are you watching the the uh, arrivals of attendees yes there's the, the only one up there refuses to join as a panelist so she'll stay there for a while okay fine uh very good um will be one of the things that um i want to bring into our conversation uh, especially in preparation for next time which will be our last time until next fall um is the sacred geometry that's going on and that the earthiness of the birth at the very bottom is so important in the water you know that we we're we're born out of water <laughs> um we're mm -hmm. we're fish before we're humans you know and so that's very clear in the bottom of your collage that that has um is like the first two chakras and the birthing experience and then this level Re remember this that the level that she has across the orange and the gateways in sacred geometry that would be seen as the ego the um the place where we have to go through in order to go down into those depths so she has gates there and light there and a sense of invitation or even a sense that you could go further but one has to make a decision to go through that gate. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many of us just stay there. But as we talk further, you'll see that this is the way um, churches are built, cathedrals, temples, usually in a place in the ground that has a well. There's usually a well. There's a well under shards. Um, all the great cathedrals is because um, humans, when we be, when we gather and begin to build a community, it's around a well. Mm. And then more people gather around the well and we begin to build seats. It becomes a place where we gather to be together, eventually to celebrate anything, to cleanse ourselves. It becomes more and more important until it becomes shards. So um, it's something to see in Nancy's uh, beautiful collage, the whole beginning of the birth, out of the earth comes the water, and then there's the gate of the uh, ego, the human being, and consciousness. If I may, all of a sudden I was reminded when I was in Paris in 1989, of a quick just a quick sketch walking across um paris to paris the bridge over the river seine oh and, yes and looking in from here to there all of a sudden it became look at the connections within from left to right and right to left of paris to paris it was still paris and this uh -huh. inner well of a river flowing um I love the directionless flow here, where it's mm -hmm. more the reflections of the lights and and oh. that, and then the majesty above. The sacred geometry to me, here to there, and then side to side. It just uh -huh. it it plays the how do you stand on the ground? How do you extend to the sides? Mm -hmm. How do you open and close? And how do you reach for the sky? Except in this image, it's all four of those at the same time. 
which to me is an architectural sacred geometry statement of capital S self in the small uh, S self. So yeah, that I'd like to um, point out if, if any of you have been uh, in the, um, well, maybe you have seen the wells in the um, churches in Europe, but uh, I have been down in the bottom of St. John the Divine in Manhattan, and it's exactly like this. Um, oh, wow. There is a well there. It's very damp down there. And um, the the pillars come up, right? As you have in this, in uh, Nancy's collage, you see how the pillars come up. Well, you see those um, up to the bottom of the floor of the cathedral. And they are made of huge rocks. They're enormous. I can't remember. I think that there are seven of them um, holding up the whole church. Um, beyond that are where the bodies are buried. But uh, these, these pillars go up to the floor made of huge rocks. And then from the floor on up, when you walk into the cathedral, they're marble. They're absolutely gorgeous marble. marble. And um, when you go into a cathedral, if you want to go down into the entrails of the cathedral, you usually need to know somebody who can show mm -hmm. you how to mm -hmm. get there. Um, and at St. John's, you would not find it by yourself. Uh, I've been in the Cathedral of La Baume in, in France, and you might come upon it if you wandered around the cathedral. But when you do find it and you go down, the same thing, these pillars are holding up the cathedral. And there is uh, the um, skull of Magdalene, Mary Magdalene. It, and there's a, a beautiful plaque on the wall that shows that uh, this skull has been visited by every pre, every um, pope. Well, Colleen, all right. yeah. you brought up really quickly, you brought up the whole sacred geometry, architectural beginning, point of beginning concept of the water line. And it is to build roughly up from below out of the ground to level and then cut your stones to finish forward upward and that's why you see the rustication at the low parts big big rustic stones it's just getting out of the ground to a foundation level where now we can build some floors that's uh -huh. mundane but it's that rough unconscious uprising of of conscious architecture in a sacred way that's in commune with nature and then on top of that that's the temple foundation rough big seven stones that are they're strong and they need they need no form they have their life they're millions of years and then on top of that everything that's gracious and refined and exquisite is placed so oh, i'm well, glad you brought up the seven stones because that's yeah. that's always been key to me with especially that one because it comes up even from within. You don't see the seven stones unless you've been to that well. You don't know this majesty of just caveman named Grog architects, you know? It's just- <laughs> That's really it's like, holding this together. Yeah, it's like <laughs> pre-Salvador Gaudi or Anthony Gaudi, but it's majesty of nature. And then on top of that, we put our, our mark. Did I All right, that? let's um, let's move on. Did I share a little point about that? There's um, across the world, there are these special lines that carry special energy, and most of the churches have been built on these lines. And uh, prior to that, where the animals went to, uh, man observed where the animals would go drink water, and uh, and they would be very healthy. And this also became places of pilgrimage and labor, places where they built churches. And that's how they knew, because they would watch the animals very healthy, uh, um, drinking water food from certain pools. Yeah, I, I would just like to uh, add here that uh, water is also central in Islam 
because the Kaaba, which is what everybody prays to five times a day, is a well. <laughs> and it is the well, <laughs> it is the well that uh, was given to um, Hagar by God when she was in the desert and, and lost in the middle of the uh, Arabian desert. And, and God gave her this well to drink from. And the well has always had water from that time, at least by tradition. And so people carry that water home wherever they're going back to after their pilgrimage to Mecca they carry five five gallon jerry cans of that water wow. uh, wow. back with them and so if you see a plane coming into india for example from saudi arabia it'll always have about 30 40 of the of these jerry cans carrying the water back oh, but, great <laughs> good good yeah okay uh so is diane shaman here yeah Okay, we're going to come back to her because uh, she, this is a nice collage that she's got here. Yes. Uh -huh. And but I, I, since she's not here to yeah, she's not here. Defend it. I think we'll go on. And uh, next is uh, and this is Diane's. But next is Jerome. So Jerome, I will we're stop my a, share. A movie from Jerome. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop my share, Jerome, and and okay. you can show your movie. Yes. All right. Hold on, just a minute. Uh, would yeah. you get the speakers that are in there? They're laying on the floor. Wherever my computer is, two little white boxes speakers. Okay. Can you see this yet? Collage. Creative process, intention, gathering, intimation, <laughs> wonderful. Here we are. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to fly far to this. The first part, the uh, first minute, I explain each of these processes, but I'm going to put this on my YouTube channel, but I'll review each of the processes. But I'm, I'm just going to start with the first one. So, the You're getting this first on? step is intention. Yeah. So Colleen's assignment for this particular collage was to set an intention by asking a question. What was the religious card that I was born with? The second step was to go out collecting information from magazines, artworks, anything you could come up with. And I was struck by an announcement in the Chicago Sun-Times of the Art Institute of Chicago announcing an exhibit of a 28-foot high and 18-foot wide restored Tiffany glass church window. It showed a landscape of mountains and streams flowing down into lakes. So I thought, that's unusual for a stained glass in a church having no traditional religious icons. So I investigated further and the window was installed in 1917 in a Baptist church in Providence, Rhode Island. And it was a memorial tribute. The Tiffany glass was inspired by Mount Chukora in New Hampshire is part of the White Mountain Range. The next step is intimations. So my intimation number one was a scene of the river flowing down the mountain to the lakes below. And then intimation number two came. It just sprung up. I remembered a song lyric by Pete Townsend called the Ferryman, based upon Herman Hesse's novel, Siddhartha. In Siddhartha's spiritual request, he meets an enlightened ferryman who takes people across the river, and from him, Siddhartha learns the secrets of the river and eventually takes the ferryman's place. 
And then intimation number three. My spiritual quest began in 1974 when a co-worker, a former Franciscan monk, gave me a copy of Siddhartha. And so that began the uh, search and seeking. So the next step is illumination. So I combined the intimations into this following video collage as a tribute to my beginning, what I call the quest. The Ferryman. The river is always flowing, relentless towards the coastal tides. It travels down to the great ocean, while most of us simply watch from the water side. The water becomes Siddhartha's teacher, sometimes powerful and stern, sometimes gentle, forgiving. It never changes in direction as it carries even mountains down to the sea. I'll take you over. I don't want your money. Just hang on tight till we reach the other wall. Thins and Vigas, they all cling to my ankle. The horn blows wide and the currents roar. God, feel this gutter that breaks my shoulder. Smash me to pieces and wash me to mud. Dry me to dust and set me to smolder. Please let me dissolve in the autumn flood. The river's always flowing, but I'm free now. From its grace, I'll be swept down to the ocean. And now you will take my place. My help cometh from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Psalm 121.2 After the collage, the next step is reflection. So the religious card I was born with is as a seeker of truth and listening to nature as my guiding light. The last step of the creative process is called validation by showing it to others. So tell me your reaction to the video collage. <laughs> Just to give you an idea, here's the window that's in the opening, that opened May 27th, restored. Mm. That's okay. A, that's a Tiffany window, is it? Yes, it was uh, a, tif uh, a tif Tiffany window. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let me get back to here. Yeah. This, that's this window that, that was in that church I showed you once before. Right, right. And they took it out of the church, and then they restored it. And it's now on display, and they backlit it uh, with LED lights, and they restored the panels. The Tiffany glass was amazing. And there's a story about the Tiffany glass and how they restored it on the Art Institute uh, web website. So if you go to that website, you can see a whole video on how they took this out of the church and restored it. It took them two years to do it. Right and reconstruct it, but it's just beautiful. Uh, anyway. Question, would they be putting it back in the church? Where no, no, no. The church couldn't afford to fix it, and so they, 
they, but they didn't want to tear it apart, and so they arranged to have them uh, take it. So yeah, and the Tiffany Tiffany stained glass windows are just a, in a world apart compared to all other stained glass. Um, and I have a friend who looked for a Tiffany window in a church for. I don't know, I think he looked for about a decade and he found one in uh, Kansas that they were tearing down the old church. And he bought it from them for $125,000. <laughs> and then he had it installed in his the ceiling of his kitchen. And yeah. so it was Im impossible to appreciate there. Yeah. But I mean, he had this huge rose window yeah. where you looked up in the ceiling. And... Um, oh. To me, it lost uh, <laughs> lost something in that transition, but uh, all the other Tiffany windows I've ever seen have been remarkable. Well, so anyway, uh, Siddhartha, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but mm -hmm. uh, Herman Hesse was, uh, back in 1916 and 17, uh, was under psychoanalysis and he met with uh, Young Young gave him a private copy of the Sermons of the Dead. And uh, of course, uh, Herman Hess, uh, he, he wrote Siddhartha in 1922. And he, uh, Herman said that he could not write Siddhartha until he had the experience. He would not write it until he had that experience of when he was at the river and he listened to the river and the river is a metaphor for going through life back and forth, uh, uh, flowing down uh, from the mountain to the sea. I just thought it was great. And actually, Siddha means achieved and Artha means what was searched for, which means he who has found meaning of existence and he who has attained his goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I was, uh, the the subject was, what is my religious card? So I was <laughs> trying to think about what is it, you know? And so my first thought was, well, the three Tarot fans out there, I said, well, it's probably the magician when I was younger, but uh, the magician grows up to be the hermit. And so I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm born in September, I'm a Virgo, so uh, associated with Mercury. And so I said, okay, I'll do an I Ching. So yesterday I did an I Ching. If you're familiar with the act, toss an I Ching. So here's, I came up with Kuhn, the receptive. And uh, you could see that uh, if you're familiar with the I Ching, uh, this is the uh, yin, the yin opening is all the way through. Mm -hmm. And so you've got coming from just, just the metaphor for what. I just uh, read was you come from the mountains down to the river, river of the earth. And so this is what happened here with the synchronicity. So I just said, okay, I'll follow this along. You know? yeah. uh, Jerome, uh, can I yeah. ask your birthday? Uh, September 18th. 918 and year? 46. You want to know the time? It's three thirty p.m. <laughs> actually, I, yeah, I would actually rather than Astro, I, I just okay. I, I love that he's a you're, dog in the Chinese. Well, I was your six seven twenty twenty one is a moon hermit date. I just wanted to do your tarot birth card. Okay, um, you can do that. I'll pop. Tarot. I'll pop back right. in a little bit. All right. In the meantime, who I really identify with? If you're familiar with Young's Stone at Bollingen. Mm -hmm. uh, the little uh, Kavira figure, which he called, uh, uh, what was his name, Skip? Uh, uh, um, yeah. No, it's not Philemon. It's, uh, um, uh, what was his, uh, he, yeah, well, he called it the Kiver, and he was an assistant mm -hmm. to Scophilus, and I was trying to remember his name. Yeah, I can't uh, remember offhand. But anyway, he's got the symbol of Mercury on here. Mm -hmm. And his whole goal is to go uh, through all the different uh, 
areas and he has this little lantern he's carrying a light mm -hmm. and he's pointing the way to the sun and so this is kind of how i identify if that's my religious card that's probably what i'm thinking about so, Jerome, yeah. you know what's interesting is that your birth cards are the sun wheel magician and okay. then the time you pulled that six seven twenty twenty one it's mm -hmm. the moon hermit so when you went magician hermit, it felt like you, you had a syzygy that you just kind of boiled down into our orbit that was so appropriate. And I, I have to say synchronicity, I copied this image four days ago. I saw it and went, oh, I have to have that. And so when this popped up, I went, look what Jerome is doing. So <laughs> yeah. it was like, thank you for this. And four words for your video for validation um heartfelt thank you jerome I, I don't know what else i could say yeah uh teleforce is the name it's a kavir yeah that's right teleforce, teleforce. yeah, yeah teleforce. and it's the the little uh it was in the eye this is an eyeball when he first carved the thing right uh, you know and uh so anyway uh just for fun uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, this is uh, for my next collage. I was thinking, and uh, Colleen mentioned colors, mm -hmm. and so I'm thinking about using kind of an alchemy thing with the way Young did this and the different colors. You have the gold, silver, the black, and you have the red. Uh, so, but that's just my idea. It keeps flowing out, Colleen. You started something. <laughs> it keeps on going. <laughs> I know it's the size of that waterfall. <laughs> There's a lot, yeah. a lot coming, Jerome. A lot get, more coming. Yeah. Yeah. Let me get this uh, off here. And, uh, Do yeah. you, I wonder if you live by the rule of uh, Hesse that he had to have experienced it first before he could do it, write it. Yes, I do. And that's what started me on the journey. And since then, instead of doing a collage of all my experiences, I said, well, what was my religious card? And then, so I started all with that. Yes. And uh, so, and then that led to young and, you know, down the road, so. Yeah, yeah now, um, while, while you were on drum, uh, Diane, uh, w was looking to get in, and I sent her the connection. Is Diane Shimon back? Uh, no. It's just Susan Vason. She's going to stay there because she refused to go in. There's nobody else wanting in. Okay. Um, Let me see if Diane came on. Yeah, I don't think she did, I guess. Um, no, I don't see her. No. Okay. Um, Okay. All right. So the next one is um, Gilda, number one. Gilda, number one. Are you there? Oh, wait a minute. I have to share the screen first. I beg your pardon. <laughs> okay, there it is. <laughs> you have to unmute Gilda in order for us to hear you. Did you, did you use the images that I sent you the second time? I, I don't know. You you, oh. you sent me four images. Right. I sent it to you again because, that, you know, they're kind of washed out. But anyway, I think you used the first set I sent you. Okay. So it turns out that um, I sent four images because you can see you, it's the same image, reversed, 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 looking mm -hmm. at it from different angles because it will give you uh, some a di different reality each time and uh, as it turns out it's really the card of the universe and it is a tree uh, that's not uh, if you turn it the other way it would be a kind of a tree of life sort of thing and with each corner having a life of their own that all connects is that, wh next which... one next one next one yes that one. that's the tree 
You see the tree now? Okay, yep. Right, so, um, but it can work. And, and then there's eyes everywhere. Uh, yeah, the second one uh, is finished. That one is, uh, in the second one, you'll be able to see the details on the side, which you can't see here. You know, I was mm -hmm. working on it today. No, the second yeah. badge I sent you. Um, I was working on it today. I did it all today and I, I go outside and then I let the trees put in their mark. Okay, so, just, a, just a comment for everyone. Um, you know, I'm I'm just a guy. I, I can't read your mind, so. Please, yeah, I sent you another please. set, but that's okay. No problem. I, um, I'm, the, I'm sorry, so, I got lost in all the things that came in and what right. I was doing too, so. So, uh, um, it turns out that it's the car of the universe, and that's one of the three numbers of my birthday, and now that people were talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it could also be the Wheel of Fortune, because if you switch it to another one, mm -hmm. can you move it to the next? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll just explain this one. It's just not clear on this. That's like a tornado going up and creating the tree, and there's gold in the middle. And that gold, uh, when seen properly, turned out to be uh, some some animals. So you can see animals everywhere. Uh, they just came out. So between trees, animals, and nature, it turns out that that is the origin of my religious card. It comes from the primordial that nature creates. And then out of that, I my being communes because it is part of it. So um, it is the wheel of fortune, it is the universe, both together. And in the middle, there's nothing. It's that emptiness that allows something to arise in the very center of the goal, and that's why those petals are black. Um, and there's eyes everywhere that create form in every corner. Uh, they can be seen better in the other take, but nonetheless. Um, and if you turn it, uh, let's see. So that one is a tornado required, the energy shock that's required from the bottom point to rise. Uh, this one is, is, will be the Wheel of Fortune. As you can see below, you even have a chariot and, and the red animal driving it, or the animals that sometimes are underneath the wheel of the of the Wheel of Fortune, which runs time, time in cycles. And some, and I discovered that, I didn't do collage, I'm sorry. I did, I just, this came from Doodle, and ge uh, Sacred Geometry Doodle. And uh, I realized that all, when I make whatever it is, there's opening, there's an opening there on the left where that things come in and out. So. The structures, although there's a lot of round structures there that are like the flower of life, there's always an opening like the river of Jerome that is connected to the universe or to cosmic being, to primordial life, to that which uh, comes and goes. So that is what I have to say. And if you, uh, so that one is, you can see it to the left very clearly in the center. It turns out there's a little animal with wings and it's gold. And you can see animals all over the place. Uh, uh, it, mm -hmm. uh, there's rabbits, there's, and then the big tree. It's all made out of, from circles of sacred geometry, which I started Oops. drawing. Mm -hmm. You can see that, yeah. If you turn up the, the next one, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next, yeah. So you can see the, the, the circles. And what happens is that since I do Caran uh crayons, and then I, I use the pen, and then I take a, 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 a jug of water and I give it a, a baptism. So I throw water right into it and it just does what it does. And I leave it for the trees to figure out and they created the tree because before that it was an octopus. <laughs> so, you know, that black thing, I go, oh, it, my religious card is an octopus. 
and the octopus got lost and the tree just came alive. They created themselves. I came in, went out, and there it was. So that's my, my story. Thank you. Any questions? It takes it takes me into the mandala, um, and so so much about your soft personality, and the uh, the way you go about doing things, letting them unfold. Yes, mm -hmm. I love that because they always surprise me. I yeah. don't me trying to be precise. And that sort of thing, it doesn't, doesn't work for me. I, mm. I have to open it and see who wants to come in and show, show up yeah. to, to surprise me. And I do love that because I'm always surprised. I am, you know, there's a little, well, I, and then beep, it just shows up uh -huh. just like that. Yeah. I remember the first, first one that you did and how there was the unfolding of the imagery uh, that came and it was clear. Clearly not a plan in your mind at all. You really no. ride, you ride the process and like yeah. and if and I took pictures of different corners and so on, and you can clearly see uh -huh. images of, of you know uh, a rabbit, and then uh, if you mo move it around, it's a dog. And I mean, it's just and for me, this is the nature of the unconscious. It's just right. completely a a fertile garden of of form wanting to emerge. And I allow it to emerge, and then I tie it in with something that I can share with, with you. But in yeah. reality, it did itself. Well, you I find just, yeah, you I, find bring a reality to it in the form of the, the images that yeah, come. I just co-create. Yeah, and if this were to be folded into quarters, they'd mm -hmm. all be very different. Yes, I started when I do. I take the phone and do diff, I start scanning, and there's a pregnant woman there, there's uh, animals, there's uh, faces, there, there, there's all sorts of stuff. Which, yeah, and the you know, unformed, you, you can see the, the shapes. Of, I've always, I always see this everywhere. No matter where I go, I can suddenly it starts turning into something out of, you know, na nature or when I was, for example, I, I do photography when I'm in the desert in Arizona and Utah shooting rocks okay for rock and these rocks you can witness it in my photography you can see it for yourself they're alive and you see the eyes looking in, in the face and whole thing and i saw it and then i captured it so to me it's already there and i just commune with it and and they show up <laughs> and it's exciting well, because it's new <laughs> it's I, not something I, I could it's not something i could i could you know i could uh my intelligence would, would ever design. It just can't do it. So that's well, I, why I enjoy this process. Yeah. Wonderful. I have to contribute that as you orbited orientation to orientation, to, there was all this life and all this life and all this life. And then you arrived at this one. And I went, oh my, <laughs> because now there's all this life and as Colleen says, you know, the black and white part is that that's not coming to be follow the red. But but when you said the nothingness, I thought, you know, Sarp and capital N nothingness. But at the bottom, I see that into the temple of Khufu, these melted, old, worn for thousands of years, architectural steps, just crescenting up into the secret place. And then there's that follow the red pedosaur salamander ancient creature on the right, just looking up and emerging. And it just, this view brought it all together between just those ancient temple steps. And then that new primal red creature on the, on the right. It, and then the, the triple, the Trinity, your Vesica pieces of the, of the nothingness that one, two, three, and then all this life around it with all these communities of eyes and mm -hmm. life. Yes. So I just that one, two, three, those steps and the nothingness and the red creature. I don't even want to name it. And don't forget the, the gold in the middle of the black because mm. the gold comes out of the shadow. 
Yeah. 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 There's, there's the, there's the and inner there's... splendor that comes from the darkness. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. And somehow I can make myself to be symmetrical. Yeah. <laughs> to uh, to be everything. Every, I'm reminding of Skip saying <laughs> chaos or whatever, but it, it just all yeah. unfolds in this yeah. life. Sym- life is just- the symmetry isn't really healthy. I, I find. It's because even our faces, one side to the other, is are not yeah. symmetrical. So, right. And H- Henry on the YouTube uh, chat says, "I see seahorse, representative of lifetime par- partnership." So, mm. and also he sees the middle path. He says, mm. <clears throat> "Well, I see, I see little bubbles. I'd, I'd, all these bubbles." Uh, uh, Excuse all me, these sorry. bubbles going around and all these figures going through the bubbles. And uh, so that's what I saw with the rounded uh, yes. pictures. The bubbles then, are, yeah, the eyes are there. I, I'm sorry to, to, yeah. because I need to just point it's it out. Just my, I'm just, it's, it's just my impression. But, and then yes, it looks you like can't a, see it here, but yeah. in the neck, because I was busy making it, but I said, oh, I better send it. And so I sent it. But it wasn't finished. All those bubbles you see on the corner, they are they become something. I just outlined it with the black, what they were, and so on. Mm-hmm. So you can clearly see all these details. Yeah, it looks like what... something's being born and coming forth mm-hmm. from each bubble. Uh, and they all have eyes. Yeah. All those bubbles mm-hmm. have eyes, right. and then the eyes create a figure, create something. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm just running it again. So we yeah, can, uh, Gilda, from that perspective, I, I just noticed that at each of the four, if I took a quarter of a circle with a compass at each corner and just <clears throat> just kind of <clears throat> made a property line, one, two, three, four, it's is an abstract world card. You have four yes. whole to- yes. unconscious totems. They don't need to be anything specific, but. There are four specific unconscious totem images at each of the four corners, and all this moves within it. Yes. And that it's interesting to me that unconscious totem at the outside corner of each quadrant, because that would be the beginning of the quadrant coming to the center of within. I, I that's this. I'm going to stop because this could just go all night with this one. But what, what was revealed to me, see that that figure of the red, it's pulling, if you put it the other way, right now it's a rabbit and it's a dog and all these other things, but it's also a chariot. So in reality, we have the chariot there, the chariot, uh, uh, keep going. Uh, it's on the top now, upside down. The red, it's like an animal putting a chariot, keep moving. Yes, here, you see the chariot on the left and the red animal pulling it. You see it there mm-hmm. at the bottom? Yes. And, and so that would be the chariot. And it's also the wheel of fortune. And it's also the universe. So mm-hmm. those three are, 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 are there. And then when you go explore, <clears throat> you will find uh, details like a pregnant woman and this and that and the other mm-hmm. thing, like a ship inside the bubble. It depends on which way you look at it. And, and none of this is planned. I don't. I just go about the doodle that Colleen suggested. Except I used a compass and created a flower in the middle with pencils. And oh, how boring! And then went about the whole thing, and, and things begin to show up. I think I'd like to bring this around to in the context of what we're talking about in terms of the spiritual practice, and um, and I do have something to say about this. The um, the necessity for ritual, um, which uh, Jason Smith talks about, that when we enter into participation with the mystique, um, today we've been talking about um, shedding light on our, our spiritual path and giving it a context and um, that it takes a particular, as Jason says it, and I think he says it well, it takes a particular attitude towards doing it and a kind of discipline towards doing it and a ritual. And I think that um, your ritual, Gilda, of working the way you do, that you know that you have a way of working 
of laying down color and letting the images come up and speak to you and staying with them and developing them. And, and you could develop this even further if you wanted, although it looks quite complete to me. But I think that honoring that need for ritual as well as disciplining oneself around it. I am going to use the ritual that I know that works for me. As you said, taking your doodle and engaging yourself with it and how much comes out of that and the, the implied mandala here, as well as the um, universal imagery of the symbol, you know, is, is very worth staying with. And so I'm glad you did it, but I want to point out that ritual, this is a very good example of using one's uh, discipline and understanding about yourself. That this is what works for you and it certainly does. What I did find out is, is that my love, is, is, it has love in it. And so the love of communication so yeah. to, with the primordial and, and, and nature itself. So then that, that opened and communicated through chariot, the wheel of fortune that moves time and all the quadrants showed up. Yes. So, yes. and we were doing numerology here now that, 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 uh, um, where is that Jordan? My birthday is right, 12, 17. And, and, and so the chariot is a seven, the wheel of fortune is a 10, and my, my year will be a 21. So those, the card, all those three cards are those that I just named the chariot, the wheel of fortune, and the universe. So that's synchronicity. So let's, uh, is there another? collage that we can look at because I'm concerned about the time. Yeah, yes. Di Diane has come now and I'm glad of it because uh, Diane was the one that uh, kicked me in the rear to get mine done. So <laughs> so it'll be good. I, so I saw Diane's and I said, oh my God, I better do, do something like this. So anyway, go ahead, Diane. You have to unmute. Okay, sorry, I'm so late. I was just struggling with technology. Sorry, um, I finally found the link. So, um, yeah, this is, um, I call this World Temple Look Anew. And Could you say that again? I didn't hear it. World Temple Look Anew. Oh. And if, if you could show the other... Um, photo do you do you have it this was uh, yes i do this, this this one this article served as an intimation for me and um it's uh also very much so it says look again and this i don't know gilda maybe you know this photographer his name is where is it near uh, he's a Finnish photographer. His name is Nico. Uh, I can't read it really there. Lu Lu Luoma or something like that. Lu Lucena, I think. Uh, can you Lu read it? Yeah, it says Nico Lucena, I think. Okay. Anyway, he um, took Picasso's very famous painting. And um, I don't know exactly his technique, but he... He, he uses uh, uh, analog um, developing photography de in his studio. He develops different, use different, uses different filters. I don't know if he uses it on the original or what, but he takes it apart and puts it back together with lots of different lights. And it's sort of um, this theme of, look anew it says in the article look anew they say look again at the top here but this is in my book where dreams coincide it's a thing taking things apart and look looking anew and so you want to go back to my collage now uh, skip please yeah okay so tell me the name of the collage again and i'll put it in here it's uh and my last name is spelled c-h-e C H E. Yes. Thank you. And, um, 
So it's called World Temple. And then a long, I forget what you call that mark, that long mark. Uh, and it's look anew. Look, look anew. You mean like, like this? Uh, yes, three. And then, and, okay, look. Yeah, anew. anew. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, just looking at all of the, the, for me, you know, I, I know that Jung says that you all have, you've, you're born with a certain um, religion, religious card calling you said, but, you know, I really wasn't, <laughs> I didn't have much of a religious upbringing at all. I was taking to Sunday school and you know, just dropped off and, you know, occasionally visited churches and things. But it I certainly, you know, my culture is the basis of Christianity. And you can see that in the left quadrant, the last, the left corner. This is uh, a, an artist who made a Christmas card. And I see this as Jesus just leading the flock into the light. So yeah. there is that, but I've certainly... Uh, and when I was 18 years old at the University of Texas, I took a course with a man named Raja Rao, and he uh, taught us uh, the Vedanta, really. But I mean, just that consciousness is the 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 basis, the primary uh, creator, the absolute is really consciousness itself. And so I've, and then he also, I studied with him, Mayana Buddhism. And, um, but, it, but even before I met him, I have been introduced to Carl Jung and felt a lot of um, really a consciousness awakening in me at the age of 18. And so I've looked into all kinds of religions and all kinds of religious symbols. And so I found in, in the same magazines that I found for the collage I did um, last, the, I guess it was about a month ago, wasn't it now, but, uh, was from the same magazines and influenced as well from visiting that bookshop where I um, got the book from Monet. And so it's sort of like this, this is very similar to the same thing. It seems to be my path is just taking things apart and putting them back together and looking at it in a new way. And I think that that's what the myth is. And that's the mystical path I've been on. Yes. Can you tell us more about the images that you've chosen? Uh, the one that's in the lower left-hand corner? Yes, that was um, painted. It was a he, it actually, it, I believe he's Japanese American, and he is a painter. And he uh, really, uh, his name, his uh, path to fame was in doing crisp cards, greeting cards. And yeah. so this is. From an Asian point of view, I would assume, um, and I think it, but as Jesus, because he led the flocks into the light. And then next to that, um, these are monolithic stones. Um, of course, you see Stonehenge there, but the others, the, the big one next to the uh, left hand corner. That one's from Scotland or Wales. I believe it's Wales, so, um, Scotland or Wales. I'm not sure. And then next to Stonehenge, those are other uh, of those pagan, as we would say, monuments. And then um, the one that's sort of like a pyramid. It's not a pyramid. Uh, in my last collage, I had the Sphinx. But this one is from... Um, uh, what's the name of it? I can't think of the name. In Africa, next to Egypt. <laughs> Ethiopia. Ethiopia, but also um, 
there's that's not, that's not an good. older older name. Sorry. Anyway, and then you, of course you should see Shiva there. Yes, go ahead. Let's, uh, let's not worry about identifying uh, the images so much as what you like about the images. You know why you chose them. Um, because the, I mean, that's a beautiful image that you have uh, of Jesus on that fabulous, you know, white cliff. It's it seems so appropriate, and then that monolith is so powerful. And the Stonehenge. Have you ever been to Stonehenge or been to those places? I haven't been to Stonehenge. I've been to Egypt. Yeah. Um, and I've lived in the desert, and so you see the desert paths. And as I said, I've been to India and I've studied with uh, a guru in India, as yeah. well as my professor at the University of Texas. He's a very well-known philosopher. His name is Raja Rao. And then, uh, so the other things are... You've done a lot of study then. Uh, I mean, having been raised in the Christian church, uh, you really took a right turn, maybe we'll call it, into the Eastern religions. Right. And, you know, I, I know Jung said, you know, that's not the way we should go. <laughs> but that is the way I went. And so um, that's um, been my path. Just a moment. Um, I think you would uh, very much appreciate his introduction to the I Ching. Uh, yes. I, I know I've I've studied the I Ching. I've used the I Ching. I used it for many years ago, but now I have it on, on my iPhone too. So no. yes, I mean, even though he said, you know, we shouldn't go that way, he certainly did. No, no, he did not say that. He did not say that. Well, I mean, well, I no, he said we must go that way. Well, okay. Well, then I've been misled by certain people if like Alan, Alan Watts, for example. Yeah. If I can share what, what I'm able to see here, there, there is a, um, an attempt to create structure in your religious life. Because uh, I, this is just yeah. my, my impression that oh, yes, something in you is sensing that, that the, the, relig the religious structure is just not a foundation for you. So what I read in this pyramid is your uh, journey and attempts at solidifying a structure that gives you life. And I really love the end on top that looks like a prism full yeah. of light. So, so let's, uh, um, let's have everything that. is is a structure. Is a, is a So you are, something yeah. about you is wanting that structure, a structure. Excuse me, Gilda, let's let, have Diane go on. I just needed to correct that about Jung because he describes why it's so hard for the Western mind to take in Eastern thought and why it's so important for us to do that. And he well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, that sort of is a validation for me. I appreciate that because I have heard others emphasizing that he said, you know, we have to go through the West but I guess to the East, you know, and I, yes, there is, thank you, Gilda, there's definitely a structure there. And I couldn't help having in mind um, the, um, the geometry that you were talking about, Colleen. And um, I think that's very obvious there. And I'm thinking of doing something with a pyramid shape. Um, from this, but um, you're right. You're right on here, uh, Diane, with your structure, with the with the way you designed this coming up. Now, I had spoken about the first three chakras, and the first one would be here in the bottom, in the center, of your image where the light has yes. broken through. It's like the birthing. Yes, uh, and then goes the. Um, there's a, the willingness to go into it and then see the characters in the desert, um, yeah. and the light coming through um, these stones. And then we go up to the heart. And uh, it's as if you enter into a sacred space and you 
broken through, you've come from the bottom up and you've broken through, you go to the altar. And the altar is a place where we give our hug, where we give of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering where that would be in this, um, in, in the collage that you put together. Where would you say is the heart, the altar? Um, the heart. Well, the heart would be sort of in the center. And so um, the, 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 what is go ahead. What is the field? Is that a field of flowers? Or? Yes, that is the um, pilgrimage in Spain. And this is one of the churches along the, the pilgrimage. Oh, how wonderful. Yes, and then uh, above that is a Shinto temple in Japan. So it's the ancestors, I would say, say from the heart going up to the ancestors and at the top is, is uh, in Tibet and at... Um, it's a stupa. Yes, it's uh, the Mount the mountain there that is everyone is goes to climb so that's where that is Everest huh? Mount Everest yes mm -hmm. and so I would say the heart of it is probably in that field of flowers uh -huh. yeah it's where people make their offering yes yeah. and I, I, I would be reading I, I would be re remiss if I didn't point out that this structure in the lower right is the seven pillars of wisdom mm. oh. and, at Wadi Rum. Uh, oh. It's in Jordan. And it's yes. where, where uh, T.E. Uh, Lawrence hung out there for about two years. That's where he wrote the book. Or, there, that's where his base was when he was uh, having the experiences writing the book, but that's the seven pillars there. Did you know that, Diane? Yes, 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 I did. Yes, and I, yeah, I was aware of that. But, you know, I get kind of tongue-tied when I'm <laughs> presenting here. And for names just go out of my head. So. I, I also see that, that through the blue, you kind of weave the path from the bottom, the sky, and then the desert with the... Um, the uh, dark image there and then up like that. So it, there's a path through the blue. And if yeah. one, one turns around the image and places it, that figure, that dark sculpture there in the desert is where the heart should, where the heart is in reality, because we're seeing it opposite, you know, we're seeing it facing like this. But when you put it in front of you as, as, as few were behind it, then that would be where the heart could possibly be. And who is that in that in that that's, sculpture? That's Shiva. Shiva. Yeah. All Shiva. right. Yeah. The mighty Shiva. Yes. Yes. And he's um, actually those people in the desert are going up a path and he's sort of there above them. Here I am. Here I am. Yeah. And I see question red, which is um, the color that we follow, follow the path of red, and there you are. Yes, there yes. You are. One of the things that when I'm going to suggest that you take it into a shrine next time, although you very much have a shrine here, but one of the things that uh, we look for is that in the sacred geometry, there's always protectors uh, you, at the gate. Before we enter in, um, I'm looking for an example here. Like you could fold your, let's see, there, you could fold your um, paper like this so that you have protectors um, outside that people not, that that uh, intruders have to deal with before they come in. They're usually gargoyles. You know, if you look at St. John the Divine again, or if you look at up in San Francisco um, at Grace Cathedral, everywhere you see the gargoyles and they are the protectors. And uh, for me, they are my Japanese Aikido teachers. Um, 
that protect me. Um, but when they're in the shape of gargoyles, in China, they call them hung and ha. And if you've been to the Chinese temples, you'll see Humph and Ha are standing outside the Buddhist temples. And they're usually about 20 feet tall, at least. They're big. And one has got a big open mouth that goes Ha. And Humph does Humph and says, who do you think? Who do you think you are that you can come in here? Ha, I know who you are. You have no right to come in here. And Joseph Campbell describes these two Beautifully, <laughs> beautifully. Yeah. Uh, so when you're talking about wanting to make more of a shrine of it, Diane, I urge you to do that. Uh, okay. Think about it having doors and think about who, who would you put there to protect you um, before, you know, not anybody can come into your tent. Not anybody. You want to uh, thin out the crowd. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I just want to add, I remembered now, see the, the pyramid that the top is cut off here. It's in um, Sudan, but there is a country that was called Nubia at the time. And one of my, I studied as well at the University of Texas is at Austin with Hamza al-Din, who is a oud player, and he's a very well-known oud player. And so that is also all of this is sort of the basis of my path. And um, it's um, very numinous. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Really Thank you. Really. Thank you very much for your suggestion, Colleen. Now I'm definitely going to think about that and how I can move forward. Thank you. Well, I thank you, Diane. It's, it's beautiful. I and mean, it, it really does tell the story of your spiritual path. It really does. Thank you. And I, I'm grateful to, to you, Diane, because we have one left, Colleen, and that's me. And <laughs> this is my spiritual path. It's, uh, I'm a P, not a J, so uh, I don't tend to make straight lines very often. Um, but uh, what I did, I, because I knew you had this sacred geometry slide, which we're going to do next, and it goes from bottom to top. And so what I did was take my path uh, from childhood on. So in the beginning of my childhood, I was living in the Mojave Desert where the Navy has a testing station. And then I went to Kodiak, Alaska. So there was no religious training per se, but as you can see, uh, this mountain is called Barometer and it overshadows everything there. And this is the air base there. And when uh, we flew out of uh, Kodiak coming home on December 31st, 1953, and about two months previously, um, right at the end of this runway is a road that goes from the town into the base. And um, there's a stoplight there. And about two months earlier, a sailor, maybe three sheets to the wind, had st stopped at that st stoplight and turned left. And he went off the end of the runway. And although this cliff looks peaceful here, it's actually about 50 feet high. And he went off the end of it. And disappeared and nobody knew where he went okay because he was in a jeep and he disappeared and so on december 31st 1953 we get in this old a4d airplane navy airplane to come back to seattle and um, there is his coffin in in the um, uh, in the airplane with us coming home right in front of me about a foot and a half in front of me because it was bucket seats in that those days. And so then my first real introduction to religion per se was this church in Pawpaw, Michigan, which is a Presbyterian church. And then um, 
also early on in my fifth grade year, this is a Presbyterian church in upstate New York in my hometown, uh, of which I'm still a member officially. And then this is the Navy Chapel at Norfolk. And it was there that I heard the Navy hymn for the first time. And I pretty much cannot um, talk about the Navy hymn without getting emotional. Um, but uh, I also was introduced to it here when I was 12 years old. This is the chapel at the Naval Academy, uh, the Cathedral of the Navy. And in that chapel, uh, always on the hymn panel, you will find this number 808. And that is the hymn number of Eternal Father, the Navy hymn. And right here, right over the altar is um, in gold, Eternal Father Strong to Save is there. Uh, and directly under this dome, one floor down is the crypt of John Paul Jones, who was the father of the Navy. And um, then in my high school years, I was, I went to Japan. So this is a picture of my high school, actually. Uh, it was a time when there was bad air pollution in Tokyo, Yokohama. And so it looks pretty grim. It's the only building that survived World War II in Yokohama. It, it was stucco building and it was used as a hospital uh, during the war. And I moved to a home that was one mile from this guy, the great Buddha of Kamakura. And you mentioned the two um, demons, um, Colleen. Here, here's the gate with the two demons in the front of, of the uh, great Buddha. And the idea is that this is scaring you away and you have to step through into the, into the garden. And you can see he's back here hidden back in the garden. Yeah. And, and uh, then you find this. And then um, this statue is called the Ofuna Canon. And I saw, pardon? Kuan Yin. Yes, Kuan Yin. And uh, in Japan, it's called the Goddess of Mercy um, uh, or Kanan. Uh, but Kuan Yin is the Chinese for that. And uh, she is um, the goddess who goes into hell and redeems the souls that are there. And she was built, fi finished one month before I arrived in Japan in 1962. Uh, in January 62, I got to Japan. And thereafter, when I went to school in Yokohama, every day I would see this statue. And I didn't know that it it, it's a war memorial. It's actually a war memorial uh, redeeming the souls of the Japanese war dead which I didn't know until about five years ago. But what I found is that she was always quite soothing to me. And, and in high school, we have lots of things going on, uh, worries as a, as a high school student. And every time I would see her, um, it would soothe me. And so here is homage to the Navy hymn again. Um, it turns out, and this is the, these are the first two verses of it, but it turns out that it's a reference to um, Acts 27 and 28 when the Apostle Paul was actually shipwrecked on Malta. And one thing I didn't know, I've always seen in the hymnal uh, the word Melita, M-E-L-I-T-O, on the hymnal at that page. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was the author, but actually it means Malta. <laughs> and so anyway, then um, I went on to college and this is the chapel at Hamilton College. This is Al Alexander Hamilton. And um, that's a chapel that was built in 1827. 
and we were required to go to chapel uh, twice a week, once at uh, every Tuesday. Uh, the whole campus came to the chapel for uh, assembly because we didn't have email in those days. So that, that's the only way they could get the word out to people. And then you had to also attend chapel on Sunday. It was a Presbyterian school, but if you happened to be Jewish, you could go to the temple or you could go to a Catholic church if you wanted to, but you had to prove that you'd go into church. That was, I was the last class to do that. So there, this is me in Vietnam. Then, um, you know, I, I think I'm fairly typical of um, young men coming up in the 50s and 60s um, in the sense that it, it was really confusing and it was super confusing for me because in addition to all the confusion that normal people have, I had all these other experiences. And uh, so this, this is my homage to my confusion. Uh, <laughs> and, Over your self-portrait. Right. And, and, uh, is that Deb there? Yes, right. And so, um, right. So Tibet, uh, in 1994, Deb sent me a fax and it said, I found the book that if I was on a de de deserted island, this is the only book I need. And it's the Tibetan book of living and dying. And that brought us into another whole phase of Buddhism. And uh, this is me as a middle-aged guy um, back when I was back in Japan for five years. And um, I went and visited Kamakura again, obviously. And then um, I started to have, um, of course, during my whole growing up time was the space age. And so this image has always meant a lot to me. And, um, you know, then we had these crazy wars in the Middle East were going on. And uh, so in 2007, I wrote this book called Tsunami of Blood. And as you see here, uh, the three Abrahamic religions are uh, delineated on a beach and then a tsunami of blood is going to wash them away. And that's pretty much proven to be true. So um, then of course I started to get exposed to Carl Jung in 1987. And um, I had a couple of very remarkable um, numinous experiences. One of them took place in the chapel at the Naval Academy. And this is, this is the picture of it. And one of them involved um, when I was reading paragraphs 746 and 747 of, of Answer to Job and uh, a flight of F-18s flew over my house right between the two paragraphs. And it just blew me away. There's a good video of it uh, on the YouTube channel. And so I got moved to um, uh, give a talk. And I gave a talk in 2019 about finding the living God, because by this time, I had found the living God, I felt. And um, so the, these two things are there because in this talk, Finding the Living God, uh, I talked about those experiences. And then uh, a month ago, yesterday, I was in Helena, Montana with Tim and um, he was showing me his sculpture, which is called this, Who Gives All Gifts. And it's, it's a monument to his, to his father and mother who had, his father had been the pastor in this particular church for 17 years. And this is quite a monumental sculpture. It's nine feet tall if it was stretched out. And, um, then also in 2019, my friend Lana Shaheen from Palestine came and uh, she's an artist and she did 
uh, this painting, which she gave me, at, we're in the House of Representatives Rayburn, Rayburn building where she was interning with Ilhan Omar. And her painting is called um, The Martyr's Mother kept the governor waiting at the peace ceremony. And, uh, and then here at the top, again, I have religious but not religious because um, for my lights, um, with, I'm with Colleen, that, that Jason Smith has really pulled together the essence of my, certainly my entire union journey, probably my entire spiritual journey too. Um, and so I re read every word of that book and I can't find a single one I disagree with. So uh, that's, that's my spiritual journey. But as you see, when I get emotional, uh, oh, and, and then the other question is, the four questions of um, Don Juan DeMarco from the movie Don Juan DeMarco are, what is sacred? What is a spirit, spirit made? What is worth living for? And what is worth dying for? And the answer to all four questions is the same, only for love. <laughs> And so this is my nine of my 10 grandchildren, the, oh. my granddaughter, um, Sirsha had not yet been born when this was taken. This was the last time we were all together. And, um, and of course, Deb is a big support in my life. So, uh, so that's sacred. Uh, of what is the spirit made? It's made of all of it. And, uh, you know, what is worth living for? All of it. Uh, what is worth dying for? Well, all of it. But also, here's the flag of the United States here. And uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Skip. You know, as as uh, Jung and as Jason kept telling us, it's the experience that we're having yeah. that we need to validate, understand, and that's what you're doing. You're you're living it, and we know it. Right, and I'm very grateful to you, Colleen, for pushing this along because when I did this process, you know, I I got kicked in the rear by day <laughs> to actually do it. And uh, when I did this today, I found, uh, you know, I was learning quite a bit of thing, quite a few things because when I first started, I said, well, okay. Uh, yeah, I know, I know about these, um, I know about these churches that I was involved in when I was young. And then there was uh, this guy and, you know, then up here, I had some things, but I didn't remember what everything I had, you know, and, and actually this isn't everything. It's just all I could get on the page. So. <laughs> so. Well, it's putting, it's putting it into a context, which is what we need to do. And you know, uh, both Jung and Smith, uh, Jason Smith are urging us to understand that a new religion is in the making. Oh, very much so. And we're part of it. And the more we can get our heads on straight about it, the better. Um, right. I think we're going to enjoy uh, taking these images and putting them into a sacred geometry. Let's go to that. Yep. Okay. Here's the sacred geometry. Okay. So, as I have said, it went up. When a cathedral is being built, it starts with a well, and that's the first. That's the first chakra down at the bottom. It's the earth chakra. Uh, it's the I am. I have been born. I am. I have arrived. You know, and I see that in the bottom of your 
collages that you've described yours, Diane, the, the light coming through that window is like, um, I'm here, I've arrived. And so that's the first chakra. It's the well, the cave. So then we go to the second chakra, which is the water earth. And that second chakra uh, determines, it says whether we're male or female. It's at the genitals. It's the realization I am one. I have arrived and I am female. I have arrived and I am male. And that's going to affect everything. And so that's your second chakra in the body. And then in the third chakra, that's in the belly. That's the Dantian. It's the ego. It's the place to break through in order to go down to the first and second chakras. Um, and it's also the power, that Dantian power that you need to move yourself up through the next four chakras. Uh, and then the fourth chakra is the water and that's the heart. Uh, the heart chakra, the moving, is where we offer our gifts. You have it right at the top of your uh, collage, Skip. It just landed right up there about gifts <laughs> at the very top. Uh, but the gifts are at the altar. And then the next chakra is the voice. What is it that you have to say? You know, and we've we talked about that in our collages, I think the second and third classes that you need to know what it is you want to talk about uh, in order to do your art. And we're talking about our spiritual path. That's what we have to talk about. How do we take that? How do we talk about that symbolically? How do we live that symbolically? And so that's the voice that comes out uh, into this whole space of the temple, the cathedral. And then the uh, sixth chakra is the third eye of wisdom. And you see that uh, the, the, in the Christian church, we have what we call a docile cloth. And I know in the Judaic church, they have it something like that. It's, it's that which hangs behind the altar, or it can be the stained glass windows. It's what tells us what this place is all about, so that you know where you are. You know what the language is in this place. So it's the, um, it's the, it's the sixth chakra of wisdom. This is the wisdom that we live by, the symbols of that. And then the seventh, second chakra is the crown chakra, and it actually is above our crown. It connects our crown to heaven. And when you go into such a cathedral, you can see it in the image that you have skipped of the gorgeous Naval Academy Cathedral. Um, the spire from the top of the crown goes right down through. Yeah, here. Oh, you can't, I'm, it goes, can you hear me now? Yes. Goes, the spire that goes out the crown goes right down through the altar to the well. It's so important to know that. It's the spine of the human being or the Kundalini energy of the human being. So to walk into such a place and realize that that spire is coming right through the altar down to that well, and everything else around it is to support that. So perhaps using this graph, if you take your images and rearrange them, uh, you'll get this sense of you're making a shrine about your spiritual life. And then do remember the protectors that need to be out there in front. Um, it's awfully nice to have them and to know them and uh, to put them out there. This is uh, something that my son Wallace designed. So it is uh, public. It's OK to use this any way you want to. Um, but I find it to be very helpful and even accurate uh, when I compare it to Grace Cathedral. Uh, actually, the in the case of Grace Cathedral it, in San Francisco, it happens to be on the highest point. And um, 
at Mount Madonna in Watsonville here in California, we have an ashram, um, Hindu, Shinto, uh, Buddhist uh, ashram, um, very ecumenical actually. And uh, one of the last things they built for when they asked their teacher, what are we going to build first? We're going to build a school first. Well, now can we build a temple? No, we need to build a gymnasium. Well, now can we build a temple? No, we need a health center. Well, now can we build a temple? No, we need a place for people to stay when we can. We need to build a conference center. Finally, after 30 years of this, can we build a temple? Yes, it's time to build the temple. Where will it be? On the highest point of the land. And when I asked him, why did you choose the highest point of the, of the land? And he said, because that's where we found the Indian grinding stones. It had always been used as a lookout, as a special place, as a gathering place. So now we are the gathering place. We human beings are the gathering place. So um, let's gather next time, two weeks from today, and see what kind of shrines have come out of your collages about your spiritual lives. Have any questions about that? Uh, shrines. Can you talk Is about the uh, musical shrines? chord? Excuse me, Jerome. What uh, you the musical chord. You didn't. Uh... No, I didn't. <laughs> um, but um, but I know that in chanting, um, that those will evoke the energy. Those sounds are the sounds that evoke the energy of that chakra. Okay. Yeah. So I, can you please repeat the assignment to, to draw a shrine, our shrine? What is that? What is the assignment? Yeah, what is the assignment? Um, to, take, to take the images of your spiritual journey and arrange them in sacred geometry to see where they fit. You have... You have all the ingredients now. You've done the gathering. You have all the ingredients. If you arrange them so that you're speaking of this, of these chakras, of this energy, of this, of this sacred geometry, and we know it's a sacred geometry because it keeps showing up in what we've been building for eons. Is it fair to say that it would be like what our shrine would look like? Yes, absolutely. And I could imagine you painting it, Gilda. Okay. For sure. For sure, I can see you painting it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Diane Margiata has a question. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead, Jay. Diane. Um, uh, Colleen, you've talked about the altar, and I was wondering uh, if you could. Um, say again where it is usually placed in our images or collages yeah. and uh it's used uh, the word altar is used in a lot of different ways but um basically i have been reading more judaic tone um writings about that the altar is for sacrifice uh -huh. and laying your well, whatever, um, on the altar that you will sacrifice. So I don't know if that resonates with you or you think of an altar in a different way. No, I think that that fits because it's what are you willing to give up? Hmm. What are you bringing? What, and what is a sacrifice? Even uh, mm -hmm. Jason Mesh, Mesh mentions suffering the experience. You know, personal growth is not easy, you know, it's suffering the experience. And so what is it that we bring, what is it that we're offering up? And that's like our gifts. And it's also what we're willing to give up. And there is this table in the temple. There's usually a place where we make our offering. 
Talk if about I can it. share the word al altar, I believe the root word al in Spanish alta means high. So something that you place high. Mm -hmm. It's um, actually when, when Diane mentioned the um, different uses of that word, uh, there it is like an altering is going on at the altar, you know, that, that you're going to transcend from one thing to another. Um, it's the place where communion is taken, received, uh, given. It's, it's the center and it's the heart chakra. Mm. And so often when we look at a collage, we look at the center of the collage and that's usually where the person's heart is. But, you know, what, what matters to them at that level that you might want to put something very special there. What, what one grows into, what, what is it that they want to grow into? Yes, yeah. This, this is an example of um, collage of a temple that I've done. And I did, um, and so you can see the, um, let's see. This way, the lighting isn't very good. Mm. I think what I'll have to do is take a picture of this. I, I'll do that. I'll take a picture of some shrines. But this is this is one where the uh, the birthing. I have the apple, the fire, the masculine and feminine coming here uh, in the bottom of it, out of which I have been born, and consciousness has come together and there's a, an all chemical thing going on. It turns out that I turn out to be feminine, uh, female. So all that is at the bottom. And then uh, here is the sacrifice, if you might, the uh, Jesus on the cross, the um, learning of what, that's, of what the church is going to mean to me. And then here we have the church itself. And then there's a baptism going on up at this, at this part of the collage where my mind is being baptized, <laughs> where I've started to see things in a different way. This the straight ahead church isn't working for me anymore. It's not enough. And I have, it's uh, interesting, I found this image on either side. Um, Let's see if I can bring it closer here. There uh, there's a dress pattern on either side. Oh. And that's from a very old collage. I went through my old collages and um, saw this dress pattern. And here I've been working with this corset, making this <laughs> sewing with clay. So it's very promising. Something important is happening there. And then the ego, the person, the persona here is transcending into the spire at the very top. And it comes down to the bottom. That's it's interesting, the opening there, Colleen, um, how, how you have the, the opening, the dresses on each side, the pattern on each side, and that's what you've done in your current work, opened up the corset. Oh, yeah. oh that's true. Oh, I yeah. Have, yeah. And they, yeah. 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 And there's a baptism going on. Yes. Love it. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Any other questions before we wrap up tonight? Well, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you again, Jerome, for your contribution of putting these together for us. You're welcome. Thank so. you all for thank you. Very it's, This is the process we've been asked to do. Yeah. And you all are doing it. I thank you. You're, you're, uh, it's, you're a, an amazing teacher, Colleen, I must say. I, thank you. Um, oh. Yes, you yeah, are. Yeah. Very, very much needed in this time. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. I couldn't do it without all of you. Yeah. Inspirational. Yeah. Thank you. 
So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, let's have peace till we meet again two weeks from tonight, same time. Thank you. Where's my thing? Thank you.